you have a Bible, and if by chance you have your Bible or a few Bible, would you turn with me to Acts chapter 2? This is a very familiar passage in the book of Acts. Uh, Pentecost has just taken place, and Peter gives a what we call the first sermon that was ever preached from a pastor's point of view. And uh, Peter preaches the sermon, and the people say, say to him these words. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verses 41 and following. So then those who received his word were baptized, and there were added to that day 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings and fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. That's a very important word right there, awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and they were sharing them with, with all and anyone that they might have need. And day by day continually with, with one mind and in the temple and breaking bread throughout the household. And they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart and praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to them day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. Let's pray. The gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this. <coughs> that it might inspire us, it might challenge us, and teach us. We ask your Holy Spirit to speak once again to our hearts. May we remove anything that would distract us. May your presence be near to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. I hope you don't mind me just sort of walking around. I like to walk around a little bit. Um, this is known as free air preaching. And Wesley did a lot of free air preaching. George Whitfield told Wesley, he said, you need to get out of from the pulpit. He can walk around and and some of, the, some of the best sermons Wesley ever preached was out in the cattle field. Uh, don't, I don't know if he stood on the cow block because he was so small and, and short, but uh, I have sort of tended to feel like, and most people have said to me, that I do much better when, when I just stand by myself away from the pulpit. There's a cartoon in a newspaper, and in that cartoon there was a little boy he was sitting there with his mom and dad. And he's and the, the caption by the little boy, he has a little, little and what he's thinking, he says, now mom wants to go in the kitchen and fix lunch. Dad wants to hurry off to the golf course. And me, I want to play ball with my friends. Because it was Sunday morning and all of them had what they wanted to do. I want to ask you, the, the, the real question is, why do people come to church? Are there really reasons why people come to church? I want to commend you of joining together and, and your previous pastor, Tammy. Uh, uh, Tammy must have done a lot of good. I, I know her, and I don't know her that well. I know her husband, but I thoroughly heard good things about these two churches joining together. And I encourage you, I want to be encouraging to you that you continue to work together in God's kingdom because that's what we're here to do. But why are we really here as churches today? Now I can remember back when I was uh, in my teens, some of the reasons that I went to church were not exactly the best reasons whatsoever. <laughs> if you're a guy, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There was a pretty little girl that maybe was in a youth group at a certain church, and you would go to that church mainly to and try to impress that, that pretty little girl. You might be sitting beside her today. But why do people go to church? Hopefully it's because they want to learn something about Christ. Or maybe they want they haven't quite figured out life itself and, and they're trying to figure it out and the church gives you options, it gives you answers, it gives you solutions. Or perhaps we would rather do other things and sleep in. You know, one of the startling statistics, 
And George Barnum writes statistics about every 10 years of what's happening in America in the church. But one of the startling statistics that keeps getting worse, it doesn't get better, it just keeps getting worse, is that in America we have about 98% of the people in America believe in God. But out of that 98%, only about 33% actually attend a local congregation. Now, I've known a lot of folks in my time being pastor and minister of education and youth and, and all the years that I've worked in the church and really my whole career has been in the church. And I can honestly say I have heard a lot of excuses why people are not in church on Sunday morning. I've heard everything from my dog had diarrhea. And I really heard that one. I've heard everything. Well, Pastor, I can worship God on the golf course. And I, my answer to him right away was, are you? And where is the church when you're on the golf course? Because church is something that is corporate that you do with someone else, not just by yourself. It is a time together where the believers come together and worship God and spend time with God. The minister asked a little girl at, at, at the back door of the church, he says, he said to her, uh, what did you like about the service? Her comments were kind of fun, and, and knowing, knowing a small child, you know what children will say. The music was nice, but the commercial was awfully long. <laughs> and sometimes we pastors get, get labeled as that. One reason some people uh, don't go to church is that the sermon is too long. I've been accused of that a couple of times. And then sometimes there's too much music. Or sometimes it might be that somebody offends them. I had one individual say to me that uh, the reason he didn't go to church was because there's a bunch of hypocrites there. And I said, there's room for just one more. <laughs> I very startled when I said that, but he needed to hear it. <laughs> in the world we live in, we live in a world where there's mega churches, and you probably know, and there's some here in Davidson County, High Rock Community Church is one of them that has little satellite systems through both Albemarle and, and uh, through Aries. I heard that one time they had one at Myrtle Beach. But we, we know of what mega churches are, and, and mega churches are defined. It's a church over 2,000 in worship. Some of the largest churches in, the, in this country have, have uh, more than just 2,000 members. The World's Changed Ministries Church in College Park, Georgia, operates a music studio. They have a publishing house, a recording studio, computer graphics, everything. They have over 23,000 members in that congregation. It's hard for me to even imagine coming together and building a building so big that, that you can, can just put everybody in it and then know some people in that congregation. Well, what about the Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas, uh, Jewel Oldstein's church? They had to rent out the uh, arena for the Houston Rockets so his church could actually meet together. It was so large. You know, we see these mega churches, and you know, I've had friends to invite me to some of these churches. And yes, they have grown. Yes, they're doing something right. And I still say to myself, but is that all church really is? You know, we live in a world today which tends to believe the Texan way, if it's bigger, it's better. That's not necessarily so. But the biggest buildings, the largest congregations, are they really ministering in Jesus Christ the same way we should be doing? You know, I'm a baby boomer, I have sad to say, and a lot of you are probably baby boomers if you were born between 1946 and 1965, I believe it is, or 66, somewhere along in that period. You came post-World War II, and and after post-World War II, baby boomers sort of have had a lot of say-so. Uh, you know, we're the big group in the AARP group now. And we're all getting ready to retire. Lyle Schaller, who is a, a church analyst, 
uh, writes trends in the church and says baby boomers are always the ones that, that you need to listen to right now. Because what baby boomers want, baby boomers get. In the early church, uh, in, the, in the 1990s up to the present, he has said baby boomers expect a lot. This is some of the things baby boomers expect. High quality preaching in the church. Good music. Good social groups. A quality kitchen. Clean restrooms. I never realized that, but uh, to baby boomers for the most part, and they like ample parking. But, you know, if you look at those things that Bob Schiller said several years ago and you compare it to the first century church, the text that I just read to you just a few moments ago, you look at that text and you begin to see that they didn't have parking lots, they didn't have clean restrooms, they didn't have a large building of any sort. And yet, it's recorded by Luke and Acts. It says that the church grew in an enormous way the first day of the church at Pentecost. Over 3,000 converts, and they were baptized. Acts 4 says many heard and believed, and over 5,000 were joined in Acts 4. Acts 6, 7 says the number of the disciples increased rapidly. What did, what did they do that, that really impressed people to come and be a part of what we call the Christian faith? Now, I don't know how you have come into the faith. You might have been born in, into it. You know, I like to tell people that uh, uh, I came into the church after about two weeks in, in the hospital and coming home, and two weeks later I was in church and hadn't, hadn't left ever since. But however you came, whether it was your family that brought you here, or maybe a special revival meeting, a camp meeting, vacation Bible school, the music program, whatever you did, somehow you came into this congregation. And I'll bet you it falls under one of three things. Friendship, fellowship, and fellowship. Now, we'll take each one of these, and I'll make this kind of simple. I like to keep it simple so you can remember it through the week. Friendship is one of those things that I think you're, you're expressing right here, and I notice that you're a time of peace. You know, some people don't like the time of peace that you share. Uh, and, and I've always said in my congregations, um, if I was your pastor, beware of what you do, because you may be an illustration for the next church I serve. For the next sermon I served. But in one of my churches, I had one lady that complained with the PPR season. I just don't like that pastor of the peace. You know why? Because she would sit back in the very back and she wouldn't move and she just didn't like to touch people's hands. <laughs> but what you did a few moments ago is very, very much a part of what the early church was. They were showing friendship one to another. They were making friends. A psychologist failed to hear his client. And his client had come to him mainly because he was having problems. And people just, uh, he was having problems making friends. And so the psychologist was writing down and he was doing stuff. And the fellow responds in this way. He says, why don't you pay attention to me what I am saying? <coughs> <laughs> well, you can understand why the guy didn't have friends. The psychologist finally looked up at him. You don't have to call people with degrading words. Now, we're right in the middle of an election year, and, and we have two political parties that are going against each other, left and right, throwing everything that they can. It's the biggest bunch of mud swinging I've ever seen. It's kind of disgusting. Proverbs says this in Proverbs 17, 17. You might want to circle this because this is a very good one. A friend loveth at all times, but a brother is born for adversity. Let me read that to you again. A friend loveth at all times, but a brother is born for adversity. A true friend loves at all times. Now sometimes because of sibling rivalries, Brothers and sisters, sisters and sisters, brothers and brothers do not get along. 
But this scripture understands, and Proverbs writes that a, bro a friend loveth at all times, but a brother serves for adversity. In John chapter 8, the woman that was caught in adultery, Jesus was a true, showed true friendship to her. Instead of casting a stone like everyone else wanted to do, he forgave her of her sins. He says, go and sin no more. When people are down, you just don't step on them. You forgive them. You become their friend. I guess that's the hardest thing in a Christian faith is, is to understand the importance of both forgiveness and friendship and put it in the proper place. Again, in Proverbs 18, 24, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but then a friend who sticks closer to a brother. But there are times in our lives when we do need a friend. We sing the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and we know that Jesus is our friend regardless. He will accept us for who we are. And because we are followers of Christ, the church opens the doors to those who are oppressed, the outcasts, those which seems like those world, their world has fallen apart, we accept them for who they are. Jesus was a friend to the woman who committed adultery. Jesus was a friend to Zacchaeus. Jesus was a friend to Levi, the tax collector. Jesus is your friend. He is my friend. A friend loveth at all times, but a brother for adversity. Secondly, friendship, but secondly, fellowship. Now, a lot of times we get, uh, you know, the Methodist men had their breakfast this morning. I'm, I'm ashamed to a pastor that he didn't tell me about it. <laughs> and I bet you men had a good breakfast this morning. I know in some of the breakfasts I've been in throughout my career, one church in particular, we always had ham, eggs, and bacon. And I had one fellow, he was the nicest fellow in the world, I said, preacher, sure here, have another piece of ham. You know, by the time I ate three pieces of ham, I couldn't stand up and pull it. He knew that I had a short <laughs> But we, we've come to think that, that fellowship means eating food. Now, the scripture here in Acts chapter 2, when we read this scripture and we look at it, it says that they broke bread together. They shared the Lord's Supper. Sometimes we just forget what true fellowship really is. True fellowship means that we're sharing with one another. We share the burdens, we share time with one another, we share communion with one another. That's probably the best meal that we can offer in the church. But we are together. I've said it often, it's like Fellows in the same ship. If the ship is sinking, we all sink together. We just don't abandon the ship. We all sink together. Someone to find a friend this way. What is a friend? A friend are people to whom you dare to be yourself. Your soul can be naked with them. They ask you to put on nothing, only to be what you are. They do not want you to be better or worse. When you are with them, you feel as a prisoner feels who has been declared innocent. You do not have to be on your guard. You can say what you think as long as it is genuine. With them, you breathe freely, and they seek to understand you. You do not have to be careful. They like you for who you are. You can weep with them, sing with them, laugh with them, pray with them. The list goes on and on. I hope you have a true friend like that. I hope you can say that your brothers and sisters across the aisle here in this congregation, that they're your friends. You know, you've united two churches together, and I know that it's taken a little time to learn the Joneses that go to this church and the Millers that go to this church. And their families and their children, yes, the Millers probably have a, a kid like my son Josh who would despise you and, and, and really you never know what would come out of Josh's mouth when he was growing up. Good or bad. But how do you have friends that will accept and be that kind of friends? This is friendship and what we need in the church. This is one of the great characteristics of the church is friendship. 
fellowship. Fellowship in Acts chapter 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were fellows breaking bread and prayer together. They were sharing with one another. Kindergarten class was asked to bring a symbol of their faith uh, to class meeting. And as they brought their symbols, a little Jewish kid brought uh, a little uh, uh, star of David. A little Muslim kid brought a prayer rug, which was very important to him. A little Catholic child brought a crucifix. But you know what the, the Methodist kid brought? A casserole dish. <laughs> Like I said, when we think of when we think of fellowship, we do think of food. You know, we live in a world today, talking about fellowship, we live in a world today that is, is becoming less and less socialized. We live in a world in, in which if you drive up to the house, you get on your cell phone and you call us at the house and you're already there. You call to see if anybody's there. You know, we live in a, a, in a world that your daughter might sell Girl Scout cookies and she goes online and puts it online that she's selling Girl Scout cookies. There's no human contact anymore with individuals. We have somewhat lost something as a human race. You know, even the commercials on TV, and a lot of them have the website at the very bottom of the, of, of the last thing they say. Call this number, or call that, not only call this number, but you can catch us on our website page. And some dot com, <coughs> gmail.com, whatever. What's happened to our world? We've become too impersonal in so many ways. And the church of all places should be the place where fellowship is, is involved and communications continue. I guess one reason that the Waltons were such a good program and such a big success was because it was an interpersonal relationship between family members. And they would talk to one another. And at the end of the show, at the very end of the show, as John Roy would say to Mary Ellen, Good night, Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen would say, Good night, Mama. Good night, Papa. Good night, Grandpa. And all say good night to one another. You see, we live in that kind of world today that we become less personal. I hope you will take the time to get to know your neighbors and, and people around you. You know, we've almost forgotten what the old front porch is. My grandmother's place is on Highway 8. My father lived there. My, actually, my mother lived right next door. If you know where the old Whitley's Drive End used to be, which is now Speedy Lowers and 8, right across the road, the old house that's falling apart is where my dad grew up. It's got a long porch, and I can remember my grandmother going out there at the close of the day, and we'd sit and rock and occasionally watch the cars go by because there weren't many cars on 8 at that time. <laughs> I can remember those days, and you can remember those days in which you sat on the porch and talked about the day that was going on. You see, we've missed some of that. Friends would stop by and pay a visit unannounced, and there would be a connection between neighbors and families. Most of the time today, we don't even know our neighbors that live right next door to us, unless you've lived there for a long time. Most of us cannot name those names, those neighbors. Sociologists uh, identify this syndrome, they call it cocoonism. Where we're somewhat living in a cocoon, and it's a phenomenon that's becoming more and more real in our world. We settle for individual entertainment, or videos, movies, at home, and we seldom move out of our cocoon. That's not scary. You know, right now, I've, I've, I've been married for about five months now. My wife, I have a Down Syndrome stepdaughter. And we, we've had to try to move her out of her little cocoon which she's in the house. 
and get her in more involved in outside activities and with people outside of the cocoon. You know, we need to restore these true meanings of fellowship in the church because we can become victims of cocoonism ourselves in the church if we're not careful. Well, I've talked about friendship. I've talked about uh, fellowship. I want to talk, leave you one last thing, fellowship. It's a very biblical principle here. A little boy was selling postcards uh, uh, for uh, like a dollar a piece. And he had a sign, buy postcards and, and uh, help, help me help the starving children of Africa. Well, a man came by and he looked, bought a couple cards and he looked at the little boy and says, are you really going to feed all the children of starving Africa? The little boy, little boy shook his head. You know, he's only about seven, eight years old. He says, no, but I've got a friend down the road that's doing the same thing. And he had the right idea, understanding that fellowship means to do something. He understood fully the Lord's commandments that we feed for him. And those that are hungry. In order to be true Christians, we follow Christ, what He has taught us to do. In order that the Lord's church may grow, we must follow. We must be willing to follow Jesus first. Follow Him whatever. Take that up our cross and follow in Him. You see, many people come to church, but many people come to church and then they leave afterwards and they're not really following. Now, fellowship is a, 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 a word that is probably not a biblical principle, but it is there in the New Testament over and over again. James writes in the first chapter of James, be doers of the word, not just hearers only. Matthew 7, 21, and this is the one that strikes me very hard. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but only those who do my Father's will. And that's a strong one. You see, we're professing belief in Christ, but yet we're failing to follow Christ. You know, one of the, one of the three uh, mission statements of the United Methodist Church is, is that we believe in Christ, but yet we follow Christ transform the world. Fellowship is one of those things that that sometimes it, 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 it's hard for us to follow at times. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. It talks about self-denial. Following Christ may be walking to the beat of another drummer. At times, we deny ourselves of certain pleasures and comforts and things of this nature. But to follow Him, what does that really mean? What does that involve? Matthew 4 says, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Following Him means that we're fishing for people. Have you ever led a person to Christ? Some of you probably have. Some of you have made that that decision to tell your children or maybe some friend that comes to you, you've done your homework. You led somebody to Christ. Life is not just about us. It is about others. <clears throat> it's about reaching others. If there's one sin that the church of today as compared to the early church when I read this passage is, is this one thing of fellowship is that we are not quite like Christ in the early church. We like the sayings of Jesus. We hear those things about reaching and teaching, and then all of a sudden, you know, we walk out of the, the place of worship, and we continue on our own journey. Matthew 19, one of the most beloved statements that Jesus would ever say, These I have kept, said the young man, what do I lack? What do I lack to enter the kingdom of God? And Jesus said this, If you want to be perfect, go and sell for yourself all your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. 
they come on me. That's hard. And that's discipleship. And that's the part that, that gets some of us following Christ might mean giving up a lot of stuff that we just don't want to give up. You see, some people can't follow. They can only just look from a distance. And they begin to look at a distance. But Christ wants us to follow Him. In the book, None of These Diseases by Macmillan, Macmillan writes this one illustration that I like to share, especially on this sermon here. It's a very good one. Young lady goes to college, and you know how colleges are. They have an application. And some of the applications, they, they ask you questions, and then they want you to write a, a summary of what uh, the question might be and how you view this. And the <coughs> question that came to this young lady as she applied to join, go to this university, are you a leader? This bugged the young lady as she wrote back to them, and she was honest in her communications to them. She says to them this, expecting the worst she knew that she probably wouldn't be accepted at that college. But she received this letter, and when she got the letter, she didn't really want to open it, but her mom and dad insisted, and go ahead and open the letter. Now, I remind you that the thing that the college asked, are you a leader? Dear Anne, a study of these applications revealed that this year our college will receive 1,452 new leaders. We are accepting you because we feel it is imperative that we have at least one follower. <laughs> you see, in life's journey, we sometimes want to be a leader, but yet in the Christian faith, we will followers. Jesus Christ. What he said, what he did, how he treated others. Following Christ might mean that we're like a fish swimming upstream and all the other fish are swimming one way, but we're swimming, we're swimming against the stream. Being a follower of Christ is one that following after Jesus might mean denying ourselves with certain things. Taking up the cross and following him. You know, we've talked about friendship, what a friend we have in Jesus, a friend love at all times, fellowship, willing to share with one another, being parts of fellows and with one another, and then fellowship, willing to follow Jesus at any cost. This is what the Christian faith is about, friendship, fellowship, fellowship. This is what the church is. Let's pray. Well, gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this written word that it might inspire us as the early church. After the first sermon, Peter was asked, what shall we do? And Peter said, be baptized. Become followers. Fellowship one with another. Show friendship to each other. May we be the church. May we show this to the world, who we are. That we're truly followers of Christ. And we're following after Him. In Jesus' precious name.